Hi everyone! Today's video is a continuation in our series of videos on understanding and managing health anxiety. And this video is particularly important in that it brings together a lot of the information that I've previously talked about in other videos and brings it into a cohesive model to help you understand why health anxiety happens and what's going on when you experience high levels of anxiety about your health. But before I get into that, just a couple of disclaimers to go over. I'm a registered psychologist in the province of British Columbia, Canada, and this video is for informational purposes only. It is not intended as a substitute or replacement for advice from your doctor or mental health professional. So with those things out of the way, let's start talking about a model of health anxiety. Now, as I mentioned before, this is a continuation in our series of videos about understanding and managing health anxiety. This video builds a model that's based on information that I've talked about in another, in a number of the other videos, and I'm going to link to them so that you can watch those videos if you're interested in learning more. So with that background, let's start talking about a model for understanding what happens in health anxiety and how health anxiety is maintained. So it all starts with a trigger. We all experience internal or external health triggers from time to time. This could be things like unusual feelings or sensations in my throat, uh, a new mole that I've noticed, uh, reading a magazine article about someone who developed throat cancer, or finding out about a friend who developed some serious medical disease or illness. We experience these types of triggers all the time, but not everyone who's exposed to these triggers actually experiences high levels of anxiety about their health. In health anxiety, though, what the trigger does is that it activates unhelpful rules or assumptions that the person has about their health and what it means to be healthy and what it means to be sick. These underlying rules and assumptions can develop from a variety of different types of negative health experiences in the past. Things like having experienced a medical problem yourself in the past, having had a family member experience a serious illness, seeing a loved one pass away from some health condition, having family members who have health anxiety themselves, uh, finding negative information about health uh, and disease on the internet or from other sources of information. These rules and assumptions are there and they lie dormant until some trigger happens. And then the rules and assumptions become activated. It's almost like a light switch gets turned on and these rules and assumptions begin to affect how I think, how I feel, and what I do in response to the trigger. So if one of my underlying rules and assumptions about health is that I must not have any physical symptoms, uh, signs of pain or discomfort, in order for me to be healthy, or if I have a belief that if I were to miss paying attention to some important symptom, then it could kill me. So I have these beliefs. Imagine what would happen if I noticed some pain and tenderness in the side of my throat. This activates my underlying beliefs and assumptions about my health, and maybe one of those beliefs is that any sign of pain or soreness is indicative of some illness or disease. Well, how do you think I would feel? How do you think I would react if I thought those things about the pain and tenderness in the side of my throat? How would I feel every time I notice that tenderness? How would that affect what I think about what the pain and the tenderness in my throat actually means? So when the triggers interact with these underlying rules and assumptions, these, this places a person at increased risk of, experience, of experiencing health anxiety. It's, become, it's because they become much more likely to misinterpret the body sensations or the body symptoms as a sign of serious illness. They may misinterpret health-related information, and this may set off more physical symptoms and that causes me to worry more and more about it. So I notice the pain and tenderness in my throat. I think to myself that I need to pay attention to this, otherwise it could kill me. And that leads me to start believing that this could be throat cancer. 
And so what I do is I go see my doctor who takes a look at the area and says, it doesn't look too serious, but let's keep monitoring it. I interpret that to mean that my doctor doesn't really know what's going on and why would I have to keep monitoring it unless it's something really bad or dangerous. So I have all of these unhelpful and negative thoughts about my health and what this soreness and tenderness on the side of my neck means. And these unhelpful and negative thoughts trigger all sorts of anxiety. Things like increased muscle tension, my heart might start racing, I, I might be more short of breath or lightheaded, I might experience dryness in my mouth, I might experience dryness in my throat. These are all normal physical sensations associated with anxiety. But in this context, these physical sensations of anxiety just serve to act as another set of triggers that activate my unhelpful rules and assumptions about health and cause me even more negative thoughts about danger or threat related to my health, and it just makes me more and more anxious. So as I'm starting to feel more and more anxious, I want to do something to make the anxiety go away. I want to do something to alleviate the distress uh, and to alleviate the discomfort of the anxiety I'm feeling. And through this process, uh, I, it could feel like I'm spiraling out of control with my anxiety. And so there's three main things that I might try to do to try and get greater clarification on what's going on or to try and make me feel less anxious or less fearful about what's happening with my health. The first thing I might do is focus on the symptoms. If I'm afraid of what's going on with my neck and the tenderness and soreness, I might be tempted to pay really close attention to all of the sensations to notice if they're getting worse. If they're changing, if the pain or soreness is spreading, I, I want to know all of these things. So by focusing on it, I'm now noticing every little minor change and new sensation in my throat area. I've also talked in a previous video about how paying attention to physical sensations and focusing on the sensations can actually make that physical sensation feel more intense. So think about the impact that would have. The more I'm focusing on these physical sensations, the more intense they're feeling. Do you see that the trap that the health anxiety is setting, setting up for me? Now the second thing I might do to try to alleviate my anxiety is to engage in checking and reassurance seeking. I might check my throat or my mouth. I may look at my tongue in the mirror. I may touch or probe and prod at the area on my, my neck to see if it's getting more sore or, or less sore. I might go onto the internet and use Dr. Google to try and find out what might be the possible underlying cause of this soreness and tenderness in my throat. I may make an appointment with my doctor to get some reassurance or to get some testing done to see what my doctor thinks is going on. And this may take multiple appointments because my doctor isn't giving me the certainty and the absolute answers that I'm looking for. The other thing I might do to try and reduce my anxiety is avoidance or engage in safety behaviors. I may start avoiding anything to do with medical information. I might stop watching medical dramas on TV or watching documentaries about health or hospitals. If any news story comes on TV that's talking about cancer, I'll change the channel because I, I don't want to hear about it. I might avoid any places that I might get sick out of fear that my immune system has been compromised by whatever's going on in my throat. I avoid all sorts of things to try and stop the worrying about my health. So let's think about what happens if we engage in these types of behaviors to try and reduce our anxiety. We hyper-focus on the symptoms. We check them a lot and seek reassurance about them. And we engage in avoidance and safety behaviors related to the physical sensations and are concerned about what they mean. In the short term, what this does is it gives me a temporary sense of relief or control over the symptoms. If I see my doctor and my doctor says, at this point, it doesn't look like it's anything serious, it's probably just an inflamed lymph node, no big deal. That may give me a little bit of sense of relief in that moment. But then I start to think about 
what did my doctor mean by using the word probably? So the short-term relief from the anxiety by engaging in these behaviors is temporary and tends to be short-lived. But what are the long-term effects of these anxiety-reducing behaviors? What are the long-term consequences? Well, there are a number of long-term consequences of engaging in these behaviors. I've already talked about how focusing on the physical sensations can actually increase the intensity of the physical sensation. Uh, checking behaviors such as poking and prodding the side of my neck to see if the pain or tenderness is spreading, that may lead to further inflammation and further tenderness. And it's the actual checking behavior that's causing the more pain and tenderness. Seeking reassurance or certainty from my doctor or uh, seeking information on the internet, all that ends up doing is creating even more uncertainty about what's actually going on and I never get the reassurance that there is nothing seriously wrong here. In fact, it might lead me to discover all sorts of new and awful potential causes of the pain or tenderness in my throat. Even though these might be extremely rare conditions, I'm now aware that I might have this super rare but extremely awful health condition. By avoiding situations, it limits my opportunities to challenge my perceived threat in a situation. If I'm concerned that my immune system is lower because of what's going on in my throat, I avoid all of the places where I could potentially get sick, and it never gives me an opportunity to actually see if I would get sick in those places. Maybe not. Maybe there's nothing that I should be fearing about being in those places. Um, this avoidance also tends to make my world much smaller and leads to functional interference and limitations in my life. So what ends up happening is my worry about my health and what's going on in my throat continues and probably increases, which then increases my anxiety, which in turn brings on new physical sensations of anxiety, which leads me to question what's going on now. It's, it's just started in my throat, but now I'm noticing pain and soreness in my shoulders and in my neck. Is it spreading? This leads to an increased desire to focus on the symptoms, to check and seek reassurance about what's happening now. Uh, why is it spreading? And, and to avoid and use safety behaviors to try and make me less anxious. And it's just a vicious cycle that keeps going and going and going. So as you look at this model of health anxiety, you might feel a little overwhelmed to see how some of the things that you do to try and control or reduce your worry or anxiety about health is actually making your worry and anxiety worse. But the key is, by understanding this process, by understanding what causes and maintains the health anxiety, there are things that you can do to interrupt this process and break the vicious cycles. And that's what I'm going to be discussing in future videos, practical things you can do and new ways to think to interrupt this health anxiety process. But it's key and critical to understand what's going on because the tools and skills that we're going to be talking about come directly from this model. And if you want to learn more about health anxiety, I'd encourage you to check out this video as well that I've posted. So that's it for today's video. As always, thank you for making it all the way to the end of this video, and I'll see you in the next one.